Um, last time, what did we cover last time? Last time. Um, oh, some of you, uh, maybe some of you would prefer a more, you know, we, everything that we read is, is so heavily influenced by Bourbaki. Keys. So there's like definition, lemma, theorem, proof. And obviously the way I like to think about things, the way I like to present things is much more how it's discovered. You, the goal is for you guys to get practice with discovering math so that when you get to your thesis and you have to discover new math, that feeling is, is familiar. And it's not like, how am I, how am I going to write my thesis in a definition theorem? It is very important. To, don't get me wrong. Formalization is absolutely essential. We've learned time and again what happens if you keep going hand washy and uh, just using your intuition. So, But the way we human beings discover things, I believe at least, is uh, playing around. So that's why I keep a more, uh, hopefully you don't mind it too much, but I, I try to think like, forget all these, you know, who, who the hell is this Tate guy? He doesn't know anything. What could I figure out on my own? And you realize that actually he's very brilliant because the things that, you know, uh, you learn the limits of, you, you, you learn where the ideas are. You try to do everything by yourself without looking at a book, without talking to anybody. And then you say like, okay, now I'm stuck. And I don't know what, what the next interesting thing to do is. And that's where, where the, like, the big stuff is. Okay, so anyway, enough philosophizing. Where were we? We, um, we were doing topology. Okay, so topology on topology on QP. We had this compact set ZP. ZP was the set of all X in QP with absolute value less than or equal to one, right? So these are the things that look like P0, A0, P to the zero, plus A1P, plus A2P squared, and so on, these kinds of limits. Uh, QP is not itself, this is non-compact, non-compact, but it is uh, locally compact. Uh, what else did we do? Did we do any measures? Not yet, right? Oh, and we talked about what the open balls are. Okay, so the open balls, open balls are of the form yeah, it's just uh, cylinder sets, exactly. Cylinder sets. Sil, whoops, not cylinder, cylinder, cylinder sets. So they're things that look like some A plus P to the N Z P for uh, A in Q P. Right? So just some some stuff somewhere, and then Z P at a certain point. And P, so P uh, N is in Z. Right, cylinder sets. Everybody's comfortable with this? Any questions? Okay, so now let's talk about measures. So we wanna have uh, nice measures. So let's, uh, again, this is sort of the most natural thing. I think you, the most natural question you would ask next about this kind of thing. Great, we got a topology. Let's get some, we wanna do some integration theory. We wanna do some Cori analysis eventually. Um, in R, in R, well, we have, it's a field, so we have two structures. So uh, we have, uh, the additive group, the real numbers as an additive group, and there's an invariant measure. There's a measure, let me use the, the word har, the name har. There's a har measure, there's a measure that's invariant under the group action, under the action of plus, i.e., if you fix some, let's say, t in the reals, uh, we want a measure, we want d mu x such that if I integrate over all of R, some function, and assume that that function, the integral of this function does converge, if I translate by t d mu x, this should not depend on t, right? This is independent. We want, we want a measure such that this is independent of t. So I can make a change of variables, y equals x plus t, then dy is equal to dx. Oh, right, dx. dx is, what's the measure that we want that accomplishes this? All together now. Lebesgue, Lebesgue measure, right? So, so in the case of real numbers with addition, it's Lebesgue measure that accomplishes this. And, uh, well, I guess I haven't assumed that you've taken 501. Have, have I assumed that you've taken 501? You're almost all... Yeah, well, not really, because uh, this is an aside, aside. So even if you don't know what Lebesgue measure is, it's okay. 
because we're going to construct measures by hand that will be much, much simpler than Lebesgue measures. But if you have, then, then it's the obvious thing. Okay, so, so this is, of course, invariant. And uh, so this change of variables makes this in, in independent of T. Okay, there's another structure. There's another structure on the real numbers. It's a field. The other structure, other structure, other group, let's call it the other group, is R cross. So in other words, the multiplicative real numbers, the non-zero real numbers with multiplication. Now, R cross is not simply connected. It has two components, the positives and the negatives. So let's just take a connected component. Obviously, whatever we integrate on both, we'll just integrate on the one. So this is the, the positive real numbers, um, x that are positive. Okay, thought of as a group with under multiplication. So now I again want har measure, again want invariant measure, again want invariant measure. And let's not shy away from technical terms, har measure, uh, i.e., i.e., if I fix uh, t in r cross, in other words, t positive, I want the integral over r plus cross of f of the group action is now multiplication, not addition, x times t d, uh, let's call this mu x for the multiplicative, mu, mu times. Hopefully these this x is not the same as this x. This is- I guess maybe a dot would be better, seven x. <laughs> yes, but traditionally everyone puts in a times there. Uh, so I'm not going to break tradition. I'll break lots of other traditions, but that tradition I'll, I'll stick with. I want this thing to be invariant. Invariant. Yeah, so uh, like in parentheses is the operation. Uh, wait, no. Yes. Uh, I'm confusing myself. In parentheses. Uh, what do you mean? Have, uh, I'm just saying this is backslash times yeah, in, in tech. That's all. Um, yeah. So which one? The one on the top or the one in? This one. That's. <laughs> I can't. I I can't win with you guys. Um, all right. So what what change of variables would I like to make? I would like to set a new dummy variable y equal to x times t. But if I do that and take the differential, so dy t is some fixed positive real number. So this is going to be t times dx, and that of course is not invariant. Teddy. Just divide one, divide one by the other. Yeah, exactly. So we set d mu star of x to be Lebesgue divided by x itself. Then the t's cancel. If I divide one by the other, I get dx times t divided by t times xt is dy dt. And this becomes, this is the invariant number. Okay, this is the, this is par measure on the multiplicative real numbers. So far, so good. That, that answers our question for the for the multiplicative real numbers. This is uh, invariant R measure. Measure on R with multiplication and let's stick to the positives. Okay. All right, we want uh, what is, so let's try to find, try to find an invariant measure. on qp well again qp is a field so which which one let's let's start with an additive measure uh you already like proved the conditions you need for this right you mean Haar's theorem of what what right. guarantees the existence compact. i have well i have but i haven't proved the theorem of the existence of, of hard measure but i'll just construct it by hand and, and check that it verifies the conditions right so again, I'm hinting at big theorems, but trying to avoid using big theorems if I don't have to. And in, in lots of cases, you don't actually have to. It would be a crazy digression to try to prove that theorem. Uh, here. It wouldn't be the best use of our time if we want to get the. Yes. Yeah, it's not hard. It's not, but it's not that simple. Anyway, uh, let's try to find an invariant measure. Well, the first, what's the dumbest thing that we could start with? Yes. <laughs> Yes, but what does dx mean? Now x is an element of qp. And, and anyway, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> you know too much. 
Let's start with something really simple. We have this compact, this is this, you know, not finite, but compact ball of, of radius, closed radius one, right? I but, mean, I'm sorry. Uh, if we stick it to rational numbers, right? There's, there's only one hard measure, so it should be the other, right? Um, rational numbers, well, in- we have only one hard measure, so we just, so let's slow down. In the reals, the rationals are measure zero. The Lebesgue measure of the rationals is zero. So the rationals won't tell us very much about. I see. Okay, thank you. In, yeah, yeah. So very good. That's a good idea. It's a good idea. The topologies aren't the same, right? The topologies aren't the same, but uh, trying to extend something from the rationals, uh, is we're going to run into. At least by analogy, maybe not, but you know, how would you cons that this is what I'm trying to get at? How would you construct this thing? Let me not just tell you what the answer is. Here you are. This is your thesis problem, right? <laughs> construct a, a, a lemma in yeah, we'll do it in two minutes, but how would you construct har measure that's invariant? How did you find find some function from sets from open balls in QP to R that satisfies the, this invariance? I mean, the dumbest thing I would start with is normalizing something. So let's say we have such a measure. I would just take the measure of ZP to be one. Okay, let's just, start. can't do worse than that. Okay, so let's try starting with the, okay, try starting with the normalization. And let's try to work through what it, what, if there are any consequences of that. Yeah, try starting with the normalization. Normalization. Okay, well, ZP, um, let's see. ZP itself, there's this initial digit, right? It's a disjoint union over initial digits plus P times ZP, where this A0 runs from zero to P minus one. And it's a disjoint union of things like this. So the measures, if it, the thing is called a measure and it's a finite disjoint union, it had better, uh, the measure of these things had better add up. So what should the measure of these be? It's very much looking like the Lebe construction of Lebe measure. <laughs> so it's like so it's much tiny simpler tiny than LeBay. What's that? Yeah, you're sort of taking like these tiny things, right? And then you're like, yeah, but LeBay, you know, we have to worry about uncountable things. It is this finite, <laughs> right? We have sub additivity. We all have all kinds of complicated things we do for the big measure sets of measure zero. This is this thing has measure one, we just declared out of nowhere. <laughs> these guys, yes. Make them all the same size? We had better make them all the same size because they're translations of one another. If we're trying to find something that's translation invariant, these are all translations of one another. We have no other choice but to make these have measure one over P. That's what I mean by where are the ideas? This is not an idea. This is just follow the only possible thing you could, you could do, right? We have no other, these are all translations of one another, all translations of one another. one another, no other choice, choice, how do you write the word choice? Let's not start with an F, choice, but that the measure of one of these A zeros plus P Z P had better be one over P. Yes? It feels bold though, because like integers in R have measure zero, why should we expect <laughs> integers in PP to have positive measure? Because they have infinite measure. Okay, so that's a, oh, uh, it, what if it's infinite? That's true. Or what if it's zero? That's true. If it's zero, then QP is a countable union of translates of ZP, which all must have, I mean, it's not additive translates and multiplicative translates, but those multiplicative translates should scale. And when you scale zero, you should get zero. Well, that's a countable union of add additive translates too. Exactly. That's true. That's true. <laughs> So um, anyway, yeah. So we, we uh, yeah. Why does it have to be finite? If your if your compact sets have what's that? Yeah. Yeah. If your compact sets have infinite measure, I mean the the map that sends the what's, what's the trivial measure, right? If you're empty, you go to zero. If you're if you have a single point, you go to infinity. That is a measure. It's not a very fun one to work with. It's not hard. It's it well. It's not hard. Uh, uh, it, why not? 
If you it, translate a set, then either it stays empty or it stays not empty. Well, and either way, a, part of like nice regularity, maybe like it's a Borel measure too. And well, you want it not to be. Car has more conditions in translation. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay, well, I, I don't know the word R, so. <laughs> It, it's okay. It's it just means an invariant. I mean, yeah. Let's. It's not I think it's not unreasonable to take a compact set and say what would happen if we started with this thing having measure one. That that I would think. I don't know. Maybe you disagree. We're perfectly fine to disagree, but like that would be the first thing that comes to my mind. Let's start with that and see what consequences we derive from. Okay. Annoying. I thought it was an insightful question. I don't know, but I didn't know the answer before I asked it. That's just curious. Right. So, okay, so uh, we fix any one of these A zeros, right? A zero is now just from zero to P minus one. We don't know anything about any other, A zero is not some arbitrary element of QP. Um, so that's what it must be for this thing. But then you sort of immediately start guessing, oh, but I can iterate this, this process. So if I go down in, into, if I specify A zero and A one and A two, and everybody else is free, that those guys had all better have the same measure and they had all better add up to the things that, that add up to things that add up to one, right? So you're very, very uh, iterate, iterate down and you get that the measure of A0 plus A1P plus A2P squared plus your favorite element of ZP, but with a P cubed in front had better have measure One over, P one over p cubed right similarly if i take uh p inverse zp what about p inverse zp so now i'm adding a letter to the front i have an a negative one p to the negative one which is free mm -hmm. but that's a com that's a combination of possible a negative one p negative ones times zp it's i mean plus zp itself where these guys range freely and these all better have the same measure and they better have the same measure as ZP, which is one. So the measure of this thing, the measure of P inverse ZP had better be P, okay? So, so oh, this isn't hard at all. There's only one thing we could possibly do and the only thing that we should, we should think to do. So we'll make a, a function mu that takes any A, now any A in QP plus P to the n zp n could be positive or negative, and n is any integer, and return p to the negative. That's it. Okay, and this will be invariant. Question. Um, maybe I'm doing something, but so so it looks like everything that has to be zero zero because we can find a uh, the sequence of what was put involves which sorry uh what singleton i mean every point every point yes every point in qp has measure zero yes zp um zp zp is uh you can choose the first uh zp is Infinite sequences. Oh, infinite sorry. sequences. No, it, it, it's tricky. The integers yeah. are uncountable is not an obvious thing. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Yes, we should point that out. ZP, that's a good point. <laughs> it's uncountable. It's uncountable. Right? For the same reason that 2 to the n is uncountable. It's a silly question, but why is like, the measure of P inverse ZP not 1 over P? Why is the measure of P inverse ZP? Not because it's a p inverse is p copies of zp. You take zp and you add a, a p minus one, you add an, uh, a minus one, p minus one to zp for any value of a minus one. But isn't that exactly what we did for the uh... No, the, here we shifted, here we said we know what a zero is, and now we're taking positive powers of p. Yeah. Okay. So those are smaller yeah. balls, and now we're taking bigger balls. Yeah. This is this is opening up. Uh, right. You yeah. More, you, have, you have more freedom. It's a bigger set. It's a bigger uh, set. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So that's it. So so this is our measure. It's invariant by definition. 
I mean, right? So this is obviously invariant under uh, under translation invariant. And then if you want to measure the set that's not a flow on this side, you take open covers and see how small you can get. Yeah, so the topology is the Borel topology. In other words, the topology generated by open sets. The open sets are, are unions of balls. So you know what happens on each ball, and you can, uh, yeah, exactly, you generalize from there. It, this is invariant under translation. Well, I don't know yeah. if that's how that works. The Tali sets. Right. It doesn't even know how to make them here. Well, why wouldn't it be QP? So we have translation by Q. Okay. And QP mod Q in the same way that R mod Q is a non-measurable set. So here's a fun exercise. Uh, is QP mod the action of Q measurable? These are the sets that in practice we'll never have to worry about. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Mod the additive, you know, trans so it's in the same way that R mod Q is the, the thing that you would look for. Okay. Um, good, 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 good. What is the, uh, let's see, what's the measure? So here's another, uh, here's an exercise example. I don't know what it, uh, compute um, the units. What's the measure of the group of units? I'll take a minute. Yeah. Minus yes, so the, the unit group, okay, so the unit group is the set of all x's in QP, such that not uh, the xp is not less than or equal to one, but exactly equal to one. In other words, it's a set of all things that are, that look like a0 times p to the zero, plus a1 times p to the one, plus a2 p squared, and so on forever, but this guy is invertible. Very good. Why do you say that? Exactly. This thing is a free cylinder set with measure one over p, and there's p minus one possible ways to add on that first digit. Okay, so this is p minus one over p. Very yeah, simple. You say not you just mean not zero. Here. Yeah. Well, not invertible mod p. Right. <laughs> which is non-zero mod p. That's why we that's why we have parents. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, here's uh, an example. Let's look at the what's the measure of zp instead of zp cross, which has this measure. What about zp if we if I just take away the element zero? Before you say something, let's let's think about what this what this is. Okay, the fact that it's non-zero. So I can write ZP as um, as if the first element is zero, then I have P times ZP. So I have P times ZP, disjoint union, ZP cross. Right? But this P times ZP, so let me write the ZP cross first. Disjoint union, the P times ZP, is itself p squared times zp uh, disjoint union uh, p times zp cross. You see what I'm doing? So the first the first digit is non-zero or it's not non-zero. In other words, there's a p, and then the second digit is non-zero or it's non non-zero, and the first two digits are are zero, and so on. So this is a uh, union of zp. Uh, well, let's just let's just write it like this. This is a disjoint union of p to the n zp crosses, as n uh, goes from one to infinity, from zero to infinity. Rather, you, you see what I'm doing? So, uh, in other words, any element in zp has a first digit that's non-zero, that happens at some scale n. So that's it appears in that p to the n zp cross. Equal to I'm saying that that's equal to ZP. Uh, it's it's I, it's not quite right. There's there's one thing that's missing. Zero. Zero. Zero is the one thing that doesn't appear in any of these disjoint unions. Okay, so ZP take away zero. 
or in other words, ZP is equal to zero union, this disjoint product of ZP crosses with P to the ends shifted over. You, you see what I, you see, have the same picture in your head? You just, you look at A0 plus A1P plus A2P squared and so on. What's the first non-zero entry of that? Well, that's P to the N for some N times some something with a non-zero first entry. That's exactly what this decomposition of any non anything that's not zero has some initial first digit and so occurs on the right hand side uniquely. Okay. And so, well, these are all disjoint. So we should be able to write this as a sum of these disjoint unions. And the unions are uh, the measures of P to the N ZP cross. So far, so good. Um, the P to the N ZP crosses. Okay, so what, what are the, um, what's the measure of this thing? So remember what P to the N ZP cross is. It's a zero times uh, one plus zero times P plus zero times P squared all the way up to zero times P to the N. And then I have ZP cross, but ZP cross means, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, that's right. Um, I have some element ah, plus some A N plus one. It's almost harder to write this out than just to think about it. <laughs> Right, you have some number of initial digits that are all zeros. That's why you have this p to the n, and then you have your first non-zero digit. But that can be one of um, p minus one choices. Is that computation we did earlier? It's exactly the same computation, and then the other digits are all free. So what's the what's the measure of each of these? Let me let me write this over here. The measure of p to the n z p cross. There's p minus one choices for the first digit, and then wait, this set on the right p ends this star, or is it ah? There should be an a n that's non-zero. Thank you. This a n, yeah. Okay. So there's p minus one choices of this a n to be non-zero, and then everybody else here is free. Yes, p to the next one. So the so the measure of of this of each when you fix an a n a non zero a n there's p minus one of them. When you fix one, what's the what's the measure of this set? Exactly, p to the minus n minus one, which is p to the minus n plus one. Exactly as you said. Does that make sense? Okay. It's weird how the exponents go in a different order. Are you scaling by something and then those? It's exactly the same as the piatic absolute value. I think that might help. Yeah, it is, but it's just small. Like the fact that we're using is small. When you multiply things by it, they get smaller. Yeah. 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 Ye
are free. That's why it gets it gets smaller. You have less freedom. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes that's yeah. These guys are determined. The zeroth coefficient is determined. The pth coefficient and p to the zeroth coefficient is determined. P to the first coefficient is determined. P squared coefficient is determined. I have n p minus one choices for the p to the nth coefficient. All the other ones are completely free. And so what you're saying is that you have to you have to union more things to get everything. Yes. So therefore the exponent. Yes. Okay, so let's write this as uh, mm -hmm. look at this factor. There's a p minus one over p, so there's a p minus one over p times this sum, as n ranges from zero to infinity, of p to the minus n. And I think I even I know how to sum that, <laughs> uh, except I need more room to do it. So continuing the computation here. Um, so I have p minus one over p times one over one minus uh, p to the minus one, which is one over p. And if I, yeah, okay. It's really you, scary. It, work out. it had to be one because the singleton zero is going to have measure zero. I mean, I think about uh, every singleton a belongs to a plus p to the n over p, and that is a, a matter of that is a matter of p. Yes. So the intersection of all of those, exactly. Yes. Yep. That's another way of seeing something very simple. Yep. Yeah. Let me let me say. Um, wait. Don't tell me Jishen. So Jishen's comments. Let's let's just put it here. Another way to see. So okay. The the point was that removing zero did nothing to change the measure of ZP. Jishen's comment is fix any, fix any a in QP. So this a is equal to some a minus n p to the minus n plus and so on a minus one p minus one plus a zero plus and, and so on forever, right? The a lies in um, a minus n p to the minus n plus and so on a k p k. Uh, these guys are fixed plus p to the k plus one z p for every k. Okay, in other words, the the singleton containing a is contained in is contained is contained in in this. The measure of each of these, the measure of this thing, is p to the minus k, and now I can send k to infinity. These are nested; these things are all nested, and their measure goes to zero. So the measure of this thing had better be zero. So the measure of a singleton is zero. That's another way of seeing. It. That the measure of the single thing is zero. Oh, you're saying like this determines the nest on so you can nest the measure. Yeah, it just nests in smaller and smaller balls where the first however many digits you want are determined and the rest are free. <laughs> Same thing. Okay, good, good, good. Let's go. Let me check that our measure like actually sounds like this. Okay, so um it it's just very simple because the only thing you need to check them on is open balls and on open balls, they're cylinder sets. So our, our, our measurable sets are only um, uh, Right, things generated by, yeah. We're taking the topology generated by, by these open sets, yeah. Um, okay, uh, what else, what else, what else? Okay, so let's try to integrate. We have measures, we have measures, let's try to integrate. Um, so to integrate, we have measures, let's integrate. To integrate, we need functions. To integrate, we need functions. Okay, let's talk about first, there's, there's some divisions, you know, like the yeah, stuff. It's a really good question. I do just, not know. Was it just a curiosity thing, or was it like, oh, this is, I need this theory in order to like. So it, my understanding, and I would love for someone to correct me, my understanding is that this was a curiosity and people played with it. And then Tate did Tate's thesis. And then people were like, oh, we got to take this seriously. This has a lot of potential applications. It's actually, I would say Tate's thesis was already a big deal. Tate's thesis is 1950. Gelfand Graf Pietetsky Shapiro showed how when you extend this from, you reinterpret what Tate did to be GL1 of the Adele's mod GL1 of Q. I realize we haven't talked about what those things are. <laughs> 
when you reinterpret those as, as uh, when you raise those to being GL2 of the Adele's mod GL2 over Q, this is what Gail von Greif and Desi Shapiro do. Now they do this in the early 60s, maybe mid, certainly their book is out by the mid 60s. They combine that with Selberg's trace formula. Selberg's trace formula is late 50s. And they show how what people, you know, Selberg, you, one of the things Selberg does with trace formula is he proves the existence of Moss forms, which is something that Moss had constructed a couple of these things by hand, but there was no general theory that uh, the upper half plane mod SL2Z is going to have any square integral eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Why, sh why should it? That are, that are cuspidal. And uh, that's what you are able to prove from Selberg's theory. And then Gelfand had all his whole philosophy is everything should be algebra. Geometry should be algebra, dynamics should be algebra, everything should be algebra. And so he says, this stuff that you're doing with modular forms, this stuff that you guys are doing with, uh, you know, solving the Laplacian on these hyperbolic manifolds, they're all the same thing as just representations. And let me show you that you can do them adelically like Tate did. And now here's your big theory. Then come Godemann and Jacquet and show how to do this on GLN, and then comes Langlands. And now the thing is so big, uh, even I, who I like to track the history of these things, I have no idea who the first person was to mess around in this way with, with these. They're just so obvious. It's like, it's the first thing that you would write down. What Tate does is not obvious. Tate does, you know, the first kind of big step in this direction. So by Tate already, like, people had at least some very basic notions, at least toying around with these sort of things. Certainly people were toying with this. How important it was, the fact that it would, you know, dramatically... I don't know how many uh, Fields Medals you have to go back before, before there's not a Congress where someone gets a Fields Medal for doing something with piatic numbers. Uh, you have to go quite a ways back, right? So, so these things become rather important in within a decade of, of Tate. And I think not that important, although, the, I mean, A, the Fields Medal is not a great measure of anything. <laughs> B, the Fields Medal was only started, you know, once in the 30s, and then there was a big war, and then, you know, started up again with Selberg. Uh, yeah, so it's not a great measure of things. But anyway, the, the short answer to your question is, I, I'd love to know who the, who the first person was to write these things down. It, it could have been like, you know, an undergraduate exercise that someone gave. <laughs> again, this is so simple. So like a real analysis class, they're like, oh, try yeah. to something with this. Try, try the piatis, exactly. You should probably know this, but who's Tate? John Tate. John Tate, he just passed away. Uh, Two or three years ago, he uh, was a mathematician at Harvard for a long time, and he's a student of Emil Artin, who gave him this problem to try to understand. Actually, he gave it to another student before. Uh, I'll I'll find the that that history uh, it does exist. Um, his father was a physicist. His father was a physicist, and and uh huh. <laughs> Oh, Tate, you're talking about not Arden, because Arden is also a lineage in the Arden family. Anyway, right. Okay, we need some functions. So let's take functions from the from QP to what? Now you can you can think about functions from QP to QP. In fact, if you guys want a really uh, good exercise, okay. So total aside, because this is not the direction that I want to go in right now. Total aside, um, for which x. I wonder if you know this. For which x, for which x does e to the x exist? In, in QP, yes, in QP, in QP. Okay, all right. So remember what e to the x is. It's one over. All right, x. This is this is just the power series, one plus x plus x squared, and so on, in some QP. This is in in QP. For for which uh, x does does this thing make sense? Okay, that's a total aside. Um, I want to talk about complex valued functions and complex valued representations. And there's a whole other story for uh, piadic valued, and then there's l adic where l is different from p which is a whole other uh, can of beans. All right, um, we need functions. So, I mean, how do you even come up with it? Somebody throw out a function, give me a function from a piatic number to a complex number. That's x equals x. Zero is a perfectly good function, very good. That's x equals x. 
polynomials, I mean, X, X is not a good function. <laughs> this will not converge. This will not make any sense. <laughs> there you go. Okay, the valuation, exactly. The phiatic valuation, which is a, a real number. We already had a function, right? We already had a function that took QP and gave us real numbers and hence complex numbers after coercion for, for the lean people <laughs> who have to suffer with such things. Um, right, so, sorry? Can you just like take the digit expansion and then... And do what with it? Like, I mean, there's QP, then you can write some base P sort of... Um, you're, uh, you're very close. Okay, so we're getting we're getting to something like that. There is something like that. Yes, we're getting there. Uh, but this is sort of the most natural. Okay, so now you have a positive real number. You can do anything, any function on this positive real number. Now, what's the generic function on positive real numbers? Ah, so, so we haven't talked about Mellon transforms. Maybe we won't talk about Mellon transforms in the interest of time. No, we definitely will. We'll get to Mellon transforms, but I don't want to do it now because it'll take us away from piatics. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say the word Mellon transform, and I owe you a discussion of this concept later. But it's that number to the to any power. That's a generic function on positive reals. In the same way that okay, let me let me try to say what I mean by that. So, so uh, where S is, you fix an S in the complexes, fix an S in the complex. Um, it, the, the, the sense in which a, this is the generic, this is like Mellon transform generic, generic function is in the same way that um, uh, analogy, analogy is that E to the two pi I X is generic on R. Okay, you can take any function, any nice enough function, compute its projection onto these things and recover it from these things. Of course, I'm referring to Fourier analysis. Okay, so this is generic in the sense of Fourier analysis. And in exactly the same sense, the Mellon transform is Fourier analysis on the multiplicative real numbers, which by which I mean the positive real numbers, which is what the valuation takes, and it's raising it to some co complex exponent that has this effect. Okay, so let's just consider, so there's good reason. Again, I don't think this is an idea. I'm trying to isolate ideas so far. I don't think I've had a single one this, uh, this lecture. Um, everything has been just like follow exactly what your nose, what your intuition from, from being in mathematics uh, should tell you. And it should tell you that you should think about these functions. Okay. So, um, so let's let's look at this function. Th this function has an interesting property. Uh, what happens? What do we? What can we say about this function? What can we say? What can we say about this f of x equals p adic valuation to the s? It's continuous. Okay, tell me about its continuity. Yes, this isn't exactly a polynomial because it's a complex exponent, but never mind. It's uh, close wow. enough to a polynomial. Yes, indeed. This is, this is continuous. If I wiggle, I mean, all that matters is that first digit, the first non-zero digit, wherever it is, might be a positive power of P or a negative power of P. That's what determines the, the piatic valuation. Everything else is completely free to move around and without changing the value of the function. In fact, the function is locally constant. This function, this f, this f is locally constant, except at zero, away from zero. Yeah, maybe I want to take it on QP cross, so take away zero. Yes, except at zero. No, it's still continuous. Um, it is continuous at zero because if I take limits uh, to zero. And I have a huge power of P in front, which, uh, yeah. Well, uh, the valuation is continuous at zero, but once I raise it to a power, you know, anything goes. Um, okay, it's locally constant, right? Uh, should I say more about that? Uh, I.e., uh, for all X in QP, 
there exists an open set U around uh, containing X such that F uh, restricted to U is identically F at X, right? It's just exactly constant on, on this entire. That makes it very easy to integrate such things. Yeah. Functions that are, uh, you know, that are uh, constant on open balls, you know, it's just like the indicator of a ball times whatever value it takes on that ball, and then you sum these things. So let's try to compute, uh, uh, compute. Let's compute the integral. Now, this thing is going to blow up. If I compute it over QP, uh, the integral is going to blow up, right? This is going to take uh, arbitrary values. Let's restrict ourselves to a compact domain. So let's, com let's compute uh, P to the S with respect to our invariant Haar measure. Z has, more has measure one. Complex. S is a complex number. We might need more restrictions on it in, the, in a second for this to converge. Okay. Okay, so one thing we can do is look at the fact that zero, when, when X is zero, this convert this is zero. Zero to any power is zero. Okay, so the first thing we can do is take away zero. Zero doesn't do anything for us. Now, ZP take away zero, we already know what ZP take away zero is. It's this disjoint union over P to the N ZP crosses. Remember we did that calculation? Because this is wherever that first non-zero digit occurs. And except for zero, there always is a first non-zero digit. And in fact, it's exactly on these sets that the value, that the absolute value function, that the p-adic value, absolute value is constant. Okay. So now I have a sum, exactly. Yeah, let's see. Hopefully I can uh, interchange these. Uh, actually, no. So far, all I'm doing is breaking up the domain. So I'm not interchanging summation integration. I'm still just integrating in the same order. Um, so I'm integrating over something of the form p to the n zp cross this p-adic value to the s dx. Yes, it'll converge. Everything is going to converge absolutely, and so I will be able to interchange. Right. I'm not interchanging orders, in fact. Here, here I'm just breaking up. Uh, yeah, there's nothing being interchanged. Yes. So what about this x? What about this valuation on this on this domain, xp is just p to the minus n, p to the minus n. And so now I have a sum as n goes from zero to infinity of p to the minus n, and then um, just the measure of p to the n zp cross. Uh, thank you very much. This has value p to the minus n. We need to have an s in there somewhere. Remember what these were? Each of these, the first digit or the, the P to the N digit is required to be non-zero. All the other digits are free. Right? Okay, well, th then this is very easy. It's a sum. You see why this is nothing, this is nothing to do with Lebesgue measure. I mean, Lebesgue, Lebesgue integrals, you know, you start with these. I mean, okay, let's not do three, 301, 501, whatever it's called. Yeah. Let's not do 501 again. Um, but it's a much more complicated argument than this. Okay, I have a P minus one over P that just pulls all the way outside. I have a P to the minus NS, P to the minus N, S, and a P to the minus N. So that's a S plus one, if I'm not mistaken. When will this converge in absolute value? Yes, S minus one, S, S plus one needs to be positive. Or in absolute value, it's the real part of S minus one that needs to be, S plus one that needs to be value. Uh, so we have absolute convergence as long as the real part of S is greater than negative one. Okay, so I'm going to restrict to this case. And then I have absolute convergence and I just have P to the minus S plus one, which is some lambda, which is as up to value less than one, raised to the nth power. Again, even I think I know how to, Evaluate that, although I almost didn't. Uh, one over one minus p to the minus s plus one. Mm -hmm. That's it. We just computed our first p-adic integral. 
The original thing was just taking the norm to the s power, as long as the real part of s is greater than negative one, integrating over this compact set. Over all of QP, this wouldn't converge anyway. Nice, easy, trivial. I mean, this is oh, this is undergrad stuff, right? This is high school stuff. We, what have we done? That's not. This is middle school stuff. How far can we go? Uh, how how lucky we go? Right, like there's nothing to it. Yeah, so just keeping track that nothing, no crazy assumptions made. You know, it's like we view everything in R or whatever, and then like we make sure we're not like. Yeah, once we get to R, it's summing know. geometric. Oh yeah, once you're there, it's fine. It's just the setup is. Yeah. All that has to be done carefully. Yes. Okay. Good. Um. Good. 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 Let's go. I've been going so slow. Um. Fine. Uh, we have these invariant measures. Have we talked about them? Okay, we've done an integral. Fine, let's move. Let's move. We've done an integral in um, QP with the additive structure. Now, let's, what, what happens with multiplicity? Okay, so what about what about QP cross, which means the non-zero elements of QP with the multiplicative structure? Is there a harm? Is there an invariant measure here? Harm measure. Our measure here. So again, what I want, what I want. Wait, I still like when we put ZP in the example, that was just a thing out of like means, right? Yeah, just to take because if I take if I don't take a compact set here, then this integral will diverge. There's no I, it'll be a sum from minus infinity to infinity. Right. We can construct functions on which right you can integrate over an infinite measure and still sure. Yes. Okay. Let's let it be zero on all of the other. For example, yes. Okay. So we don't. Yeah. This was just. Uh, this was just to practice doing integrals. What does it feel like to do a p-adic right. integral? Here's the the first function you might think of. Here's the first integral you might think of. Here's the answer to that integral. Okay. That was to warm up to harm measure on the additives. Additive p-adics. How about the multiplicative p-adics? Do we have a harm measure there? So suppose we have a function for which I can make sense of f of x d, whatever this multiplicative, that's a times, this is an x, uh, integrated over qp. Yeah, maybe right, the function variable should just not be that. <laughs> maybe it's y or something. Yeah, too late. You're, you're right, but uh, I'm too lazy to change. Uh, so, so you fix some uh, t in qp cross, and uh, we want this to be the same as the integral over f of x d star x. Right. So what are we going to do to make this invariant under under t? Well, what does t do? How does t change a measure? So if I have a set, if I have a set given, yes. You see that already? Given a set, uh, some a plus p to the n zp, a is an arbitrary element of qp. And uh, t in qp cross, what happens to the measure of the set t times a plus p to the n zp? Exactly. So t, t is in zp. That means it's equal to some uh, p to the tau times something. In, this is in p to the tau zp cross for some tau, right? There's some first, which may be far in, power yeah, power. some power that, that pulls it so that the leading coefficient is non-zero. So what this does is it is it multiplies it by p to the minus tau. So this is p to the minus tau. Uh, times the measure, uh, times the original measure. So if I don't want multiplication to change things, I do exactly the same thing as I did before. I just divide. So d star x is the harm measure we already had, d, d mu, divided by the p-adic valuation. And that it will exactly, the p-adic valuation is p to the minus tau. That'll exactly kill off this p to the minus tau. Valuation is x. 
sorry, I keep saying valuation. I mean value. Valuation is uh, E. Right, right, right. I mean, the, the p-adic absolute. I guess like norm, norm of x. Of the norm of x. x. Yes, like yes, just like dx over x. What we did for the reals is dx over x. What we're doing for the p-adics is dx over x. Except we have to make this somehow real. Well, you just take the evaluation. So the value, the, absolute value. Well, the norm would be just like you just got any. So that's the case. Say it again? Like with polynomials, you can sort of... Oh, you mean Weierstrass? Yeah. That a continuous function is... Uh, well, you'll see in a second. Uh, it's even simpler than that. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's do. Uh, let's quickly do an integral so we get used to this measure using this measure. What should we integrate? That's an example. Practice using this measure. Probably the same thing. Probably the same thing. Let's integrate x p the evaluation to the s on d x cross. And what's a nice compact thing to integrate over? The unit group, CP cross. Okay. Gosh, how are we going to do this? Well, actually, it's quite simple. Yeah, what are we going to do? Oh, I would think when you turn dx cross into the other dx, yes. over, uh, then it just becomes the same integral again, but with an s minus one at the top. Almost. That is almost exactly right. There's a dx and an x to the p, which turns the s into an s minus one. There we were integrating over zp, and we took away zero because zero has no, but here we're integrating over zp cross, but it's almost the same thing because uh, you just shift. Yes. Uh, uh, no, because zp cross is the first digit non zero, and all the other ones are free, as opposed to the one that we're removing, which is uh, we're doing p adic integrals. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> So, we're not only removing zero, removing any pure stuff. Just the first digit is zero. That's what we're removing. Just the things that have first digit zero, as opposed oh, to the thing okay. that has all digits zero. So, all these things about zero and eliminating the thing. Is yeah. Okay. So, let's, let's do the calculation. Um, well, you tell me. So okay, we already saw that this thing will make will will not change anything. On what sets is the norm constant? Am I doing too much? Yeah, this is too much. Okay, this is too much. So yeah, I've done too much. If we if we integrate this over ZP cross, on ZP cross, these all have norm one. Oh. <laughs> And there's nothing to do. So uh, so let's integrate it over ZP. So then it really is back to exactly the same calculation. Um, this ZP, of course, I should take away zero because this thing isn't even defined at zero. So now I really have to take away zero, not just, uh, I mean, the value of this function is zero anyway, but I, I can't make sense of this measure on, on zero. So, uh, so I've done nothing by removing, I've done nothing except change this S into an S minus one. And now it's exactly the same integral as before with S replaced by S minus one. The answer was this. And if I replace S by S minus one, then I get something much nicer. Ah, there's one more thing we want to do before we do that. There's one more thing we want to do, which is that, yeah, maybe I have room to squeeze it in here. Um, I could zoom in, right? Uh, let me see if I can do it without zooming in. I want, this is what, this will be an invariant measure. Any invariant measure is defined up to constant, up to scalar multiple. Uh, I want to put a constant here so that, what's my nice compact set in uh, the multiplicative QP? ZP star, yeah. So I want, let's put a constant here. Yes, I want, uh, the measure, this multiplicative harm measure of ZP star to be one. So that means I want to be able to integrate over ZP star dx over XP uh, times some constant and get one. But this integral is the ZP. Okay, now I will zoom in. The p-adic, let me make these p's a little better. The p-adic norm that's better. That's supposed to be better. <laughs> there we go. 
that's a little better. Okay, the p-adic norm on Zp star is one. one, so this doesn't do anything. And so this is just the volume of Zp star, which we already know is uh, p minus one for the first variables and then uh, one over p for all the other ones. And then there's a constant. So that's that's exactly what I want this constant to be. Yes, I want this constant. So I'll set the constant to be p over p minus one. So that's going to be the normalization. So when I go from dx star to dx over uh, uh, the x, the p absolute value, I'm going to put in a constant p over p minus one. This looks like a little fun, but in the end, does this like. You'll see this, uh, the end is the next line. Okay. The end is the next line. Okay, so I have a p over p minus one, which is just a constant, times the integral we already did previously. The integral we already did previously, let me just copy and paste it. Uh, can I get to the copier? No, I'm just gonna have to remember what it is. It's p minus one over p times one over one minus one uh, p to the minus s, not s plus one, because I replaced s by s minus one. So there's a p minus one over p times one over one minus p to the minus s. And these guys cancel. And this is a very peculiar function to get in this integral. Okay, that's why I wanted to do that integral. All right, does that make sense? Any questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I knew that we wanted them to make the norm something like dx over the p uh, absolute value of x but I can change that by any constant I like. The constant I like is the one that makes the units, the group of units have measure one, multiplicative measure one. Just in the same situation. Yeah, for the same reason as I normalize the, okay. the, the units, just... the integers to have additive measure one. I want the units to have multiplicative measure one. Oh, it's a little non-symmetric because now we're going to multiplicative measure Here you mean? Yeah. It's true. It's true. It's it's not a, it's not really a unit group. It's just a, it, it's just ZP take away the orders. Yes, it's just something else. It's just an integral I wanted to do yeah. for for no reason at all. No. <laughs> Until we see it again later <laughs> when we do it delicately. Like, yeah. yeah. And then here they're not the same. Not the same. Right. Okay. So far so good. We've done a calculation. <laughs> All right, let's get to uh, Fourier analysis. I think I can do this in 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I, you'll see, you'll see why I think I can do it in 15 minutes. Okay, let's, let's go back to R, back to R. What's a Fourier transform? Fourier transform uh, F hat of C. I take my function F of X, it's a nice real valued function. I multiply by what's the correct normalization here? <laughs> e to the two pi i x c x c. And maybe with a minus sign here, maybe not, uh, depending on if you want to think about this as a Hilbert space and if L2 is an inner product of, of these things. Um, I, I'm not going to put a minus sign only out of laziness, not out of any particular preference one way or the other. I think I do prefer it this way. So, okay. <laughs> I prefer it this way because I'm lazy. Okay, there we go. Um, so here's the Fourier transform. And there's a Fourier. In, so again, I need to make sure that F is smooth, the, the integral converges. Uh, there's a nice space, uh, the Schwartz space on which these things, you know, so let's say F is Schwartz, which depending on the book that you use, uh, either means it has quadratic decay and all of its derivatives have quadratic decay or arbitrary powers of decay, uh, whatever. We, we, we don't need to deal with, as you'll see in a second, for theatics, we don't need to. You, you'll see it'll be even simpler. Than, yes, it'll be much simpler than that. Okay, and then we have a Fourier inversion. The beauty of Fourier analysis is we have inversion. What's that? Okay, and then we have inversion. Inversion is that if I take a Fourier transform and I multiply by the conjugate, and I integrate over R B C, I should recover the original function. Okay, so this is what I mean by e to the two pi x is a generic function. I take some, I take my favorite function and I integrate it and then I get back to the particular function I wanted. 
What order? Oh, so I'm inverting. Some people like to take Fourier transforms of Fourier transforms and say that that's f of negative x. Right, right. I, I do a different, I do a plus integral for the transform, but a minus integral for the inverse transform. So, so it's not like a single operation. But yes, the, the transform has order four. Because if you just do this and you do it again, you get this with a minus sign. So you do it two more times and you get this with a plus sign. Yeah, but that's not how I, I prefer to do it. All right, so let's try to mimic this. Um, what is this function e to the two pi i x? It's an additive character, additive character from R to C, right? So let's not think about that exercise you were doing when you said the analogies. Uh, the exercise we did earlier? Yeah, like for you know, for what values of x does that even exist? Oh, but this is now we're on we're on the reals. We're on the reals. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying still for reals, right? Um, e to the 2 pi i x plus y. What's that? If I was doing qp to qp, yeah, that was qp to qp as opposed to c. To c, to c. But at the moment, no, no, at the moment, it's still just uh, reals to c in a moment, yes. Yeah. Right? This. What does it mean to be an additive character? Uh, character, it's a homomorphism, right? Of the real numbers with the, with the uh, group of addition into the complex numbers, really into the unit circle in here, uh, S1 sitting inside the complex numbers, where the group on S1 is multiplication. So e to the 2 pi xy is e to the 2 pi x times e to the 2 pi y. Right? This is a, a point on the circle. This is a point on the circle. You multiply points on the circle. You add real numbers. I mean, when you're looking at the additive group of real numbers. So uh, do we have something uh, like that for QP? So QP analog, QP analog. So I want some function that takes me from QP to S1, sitting inside the complex plane, which has the additive structure. What could I do? Do you have something whose first digit is uh... Okay. 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 That's a good start. This is one place where I'm not sure if there's an idea. We so far we only know one function. That's true. If you had a we have the constant function and the valuation function. What's that? I think the constant function is just raised to the zero. Yes, to so the zeroth power. Yes, the, yes. This function really will be. It'll take different values. Well. Okay, that's a good. That's a good. Uh, um, that's a good hint. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to say about this function. Inside the real numbers is the integers. And this function is trivial on the integers. E to the 2 pi i n is 1. n is any uh, integer. Okay. So could we make something that's trivial on the integers? Zp, yeah, the piatic integers. That's an additive character on all of QP. Here's my suggestion. So here's a function of x. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? Let's let's figure out what I mean by that. What I mean is if you take some a minus n p to the minus n plus a zero p to the zero plus a one p to the one plus this infinite sum over here, and you put it as a series, you get e to the two pi i a minus n p to the minus n plus a minus one p to the minus one, but the rest are integers. Well, it chops off. It chops itself off. These are all integers. 
I mean, it's not really an integer because it's an infinite sum. And I can't make sense of an infinite sum, but I can make sense of the limit of what this would be if I continued that infinite sum indefinitely, which would just be to, to worry about the first, the digits, the Laurent part of the Laurent expansion. What's that? I'm just doing the limit of the product. Yes, that's one way of doing it. Our, our formal series where the theatics live and pretending it's a real number. That's right, but not really, but not really, right? This This number, okay, if you like, um, I mean, I'm not really saying take this infinite number and put it in here and see what happens. I'm saying this big number is the limit of a bunch of integers. And for any integer, if, we, if you put that there, it doesn't do anything. So, we have a constant. so it's a locally constant function. It's a locally constant function. Yes, this function is locally constant. This is locally constant. The same thing as just doing more it is not the same thing as norm of x. You would have started with e to 2 pi norm of x. Um, that's, yeah. Um, it doesn't exactly relate to this. That's still everything that's not. OK, cool. It's just the same function. I don't know. Is that an idea? I think it is an idea. I think this counts as an idea. So you're saying like, oh, plug in into the series, it kills you, you know? Yes. Like, yes. And yes, it's trivial on. So this is, let's, let's check our, our, uh, it's trivial on ZP. Trivial on ZP. Check. Is it a homomorphism? Obviously it's a map into, uh, this is obviously in the complex numbers and has absolute value one. This is just some rational number. So, it, so it's e to the 2 pi i of some rational number. Okay, so it has absolute value one. In fact, it's in the unit uh, circle inside the complex numbers. Um, is it a homomorphism? Additive homomorphism. So if I take e to the 2 pi i x plus y, do I get e to the 2 pi i x times e to the 2 pi i y? You do not want to do this just for the real numbers because what's crucial here is the way carrying is going to work. And the way carrying works is literally to carry. And that carrying does continue. And when you add, you know, uh, five mod seven and three mod seven, you do get eight mod seven because this, this number is going to be cyclic mod seven. But that number gets, that carry gets pushed on to the next number and so on. And when you get into the integers, once you've carried enough that you're in the integers, you chop off either one. So yes, this formula holds. It's not trivial that this formula holds, but it does hold. Yes. It's not that artificial an idea. In fact, it's a rather beautiful one. Okay, uh, five minutes. Can we finish a discussion of Fourier and transform. I think we can, because here's what we're going to do. So what's our analog of Schwartz functions? Um, analog of Schwartz functions, analog of Schwartz. Well, what are we going to do? We're not going to talk about decay, but we can just say like compact support. Okay, let's say we have locally constant, locally constant. Which is a lot more things than... That's right, which, is, is which we do not want for Schwartz. And uh, we want locally constant and compact support. Compact support. We do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's think about this as as our analog of, of Schwartz. Wait a second. Locally constant. That means around every point, there's a ball on which the function is constant. Compact support. If I have any open cover, there's a finite subcover. What are locally constant compactly supported functions? It's just finite sums of indicator functions. Yeah, simple functions, but like finite sums of simple functions. These two things together is just simple function, yeah. 
I mean, some people allow limits or simple functions. Anyway, yeah, it's a simple function. It's a finite. Uh, it's a finite. The support is compact, right? So, so take the support of the function. Mm -hmm. At each point, you have an open ball on which the function is constant. Right. Take all those balls together. That covers the, the support. So you only need finitely many of them you to cover. Scale them by whatever you want. Yeah. So, so it's a finite sum of uh, of indicator functions of balls. That's it. Of a plus p to the n z p times your favorite constant. That's it. That's it, right? So it's a it's a sum over j c j a j p to the n j. That's that's the only finite sum, one to n. That's why this theory is so simple. Um, fine, we're gonna run out of time. So next time, next time we start with, next time we'll compute the Fourier transform of the indicator function of a plus p to the n z p, by which I mean the integral over all of QP of this function, the indicator function of a plus p to the n z p, which of course is compact, uh, times e to the two pi i. So let's take this at c e to the 2 pi i x times c dt dx. That's a calculation that we can do in four minutes, but not two. So that's where we're going to leave off. We're going to try to understand these, these Fourier transforms. And uh, yeah. OK, does this make sense? Could you have discovered all of this on your own if someone said, you know, take a week and play with it? <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends what you want to do, right? Like, if you're saying I want to define like integration, then like, yeah, maybe. If I want to have a Fourier theorem. Fourier analysis allows us to turn any functions into characters. Characters are very simple. Can I turn any function into characters? The one thing I did start thinking about here is the complexity. Okay. Maybe you'll tell me about it. Yeah. All right. 